Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me back in the back? This is on. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alex McCaskey. I'm in the uh, computer science and mathematics division here at the lab. Um, I've been back as a staff scientist for about the past two and a half years uh, after my master's degree at Virginia Tech. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you today uh, about is just sort of give you an idea of some of the cool stuff that I get to work on, you know, day in and day out. Just sort of a high level, you know, informal type of talk um, to give you an idea of, you know, the breadth of research fields that exist out here at, at the lab. And when you're a computational physicist, you know, you're, at, you're, you're applying skills from mathematics, physics, computer science, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so you get, to, you get to work in a lot of different fields, which has been really cool for me. Um, just a quick outline, so I'm going to talk a little bit about me. Uh, uh, I've got a great introduction here at the beginning, uh, so I'll probably go through this a little bit quicker than I intended. But um, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the work I've been doing over the past year to improve nuclear reactor simulations. And that's been really like a code integration type project, so two disparate codes that do two very good things and trying to merge them into one. Um, to improve sol overall solution fidelity uh, for some of our simulation tools. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about ICE. So I don't know if anybody's heard about this, but it's called Eclipse ICE. It's an Eclipse project. It uh, basically attempts to provide a workbench that improves modeling and simulation usability for just the average domain scientist. You know, people who don't actually care about the internals of what's going on computer science-wise for one of these large supercomputing codes. Uh, we provide a tool um, that sort of abstracts that complexity away. And then at the end, I'll talk about some of my work in quantum computing. Uh, specifically, I do a lot of quantum programming work and sort of looking at how to take, how to provide higher level abstractions of these really, really complex uh, quantum device architectures and then do the translation between the two and, and, and sort of provide high level abstractions for people to be able to leverage quantum computing, okay? Uh, yeah, so just quickly, uh, I, uh, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee originally, so I went to the University of Tennessee and got my bachelor's degrees in physics and math. I got an astronomy minor because I was kind of interested in doing the whole like astronomy lab where we got to go up on the roof at night and look at stars through telescopes and stuff. And so just taking that one course basically gave me a, <laughs> an astronomy minor with all the other courses I had to take. So I just ended up getting that one kind of for free. Uh, and then I went to Virginia Tech um, after a brief 18-month uh, you know, time here at Oak Ridge as a post-bachelor's appointment. And at Virginia Tech, I got my master's degree in physics. Um, and I specialized in, uh, I worked with Kiyungwa Park, uh, Dr. Kiyungwa Park, on modeling um, the electron transport properties of single molecule magnets. So individual molecules um, and putting two uh, electrodes on either side and passing current through them. And then how does the vibrational modes of that molecular magnet affect the transport properties uh, of the junction itself? These are my favorite pictures of the two places, but uh, Ayers Hall all over here for the math department. Let's see. Uh, real quickly, um, when I first started at the University of Tennessee, I started working on neutrino physics. Um, I didn't know anything about particle physics or neutrino physics. I was a freshman. And so basically the first thing I started doing was uh, just taking wavelength measurements uh, to sort of uh, look at the sensitivity of photomultiplier tubes, okay? And these things, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the picture, but the, J uh, the Japanese uh, neutrino detector, Super Cameo Conde, I believe it's called, it's a big sphere with, uh, you know, this liquid inside, and all around the inside of the sphere are these photomultiplier tubes. And they detect uh, small traces of light that appear when neutrinos pass through the, the liquid. And so we were looking at, you know, what's the sens sensitivity of these things. Really, I was just trying to see what, what it was like to even do research in, a, in an academic sense, okay, because I was just a freshman at the time. Then I moved on to doing simulations of a new neutrino detector that was being built uh, up in Minnesota, uh, this Nova neutrino detector. This is sort of where I got started in the, the computational physics realm, uh, modeling and simulation and that sort of thing. And we used... Uh, uh, Giant 3.2, which is a, a code from CERN, um, a particle physics code from CERN, based on Fortran 77. So this is where I learned like Fortran for the first time. It was, it was pretty hard <laughs> for, a, for a sophomore at the time. But uh, so yeah, that was my first couple years at uh, University of Tennessee. Then I started doing what most of you are doing right now. You're here as a summer intern for a summer student for, for Oak Ridge National Lab. 
Uh, I started working with David Bernholt in computer science research and Jay Billings. <coughs> um, and I just started doing really simple things at first. I took this, uh, this large nuclear reactor suite of codes called SCALE and provided an uh, external tool that could read some of their geometric input files and then show it in a 3D geometry on the screen. Just uh, sort of like a 3D geometry GUI type thing. Um, this is where NICE started. So the Eclipse ICE project was originally started as NICE, the NEMS Integrated Computational Environment, for the NEMS programs, Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation uh, program. I started doing initial ICE prototyping with the uh, then PI David and Jay. Um, you know, just little things, widget development. Um, I wrote a 3D editor in Python, it's just little stuff like that. I, did, I wrote an Android app that basically provided the tools in, in, in NICE on your Android phone, so that was pretty cool. Um, and like I said, just, you know, I was new. Uh, I came from a pure physics background. Um, I just tried to learn as much as I possibly could about programming and software engineering and that sort of thing. Okay. As a post-bachelor's, after I graduated in 2010, this is where I sort of uh, picked up uh, working on some quantum computing stuff. So I uh, got connected with Dr. Travis Humble, who is you know, leading uh, quantum computational scientists here at the lab, the director of the Quantum Institute here at the lab. Um, and we worked on the development of a uh, programming environment called Jade. Uh, Jade actually provided um, sort of a programming workbench for um, adiabatic quantum computing. So if you've heard of the D-Wave machine out of Canada, you know, NASA, Google bought one, Lockheed's bought one, a, number, a couple other people bought one. They're $15 million a pop, but uh, it does very, it helps very much with things like machine learning, uh, protein folding, and things like that. We'll talk about it more in a little bit. Uh, but that's what I worked on during my post-bachelor's position. And then at, at graduate school, like I said, just studied uh, molecular magnets and how vibrational modes affect electron transport across these molecules. We employ density functional theory to compute geometry minimizations for the molecule and then uh, uh, applied sort of a giant Hamiltonian, giant spin Hamiltonian um, modeling approach to sort of pick out things that we want to know like uh, conductance, like what happens when the vibrational modes are too strong to the conductance across the molecule and that sort of thing. And that's sort of what I'm showing right here. We showed, uh, we were the first to show that um, Theoretically, that so it's kind of hard to see right here, but there's a overall suppression of the current there in the center due to these molecular these vibrational modes. Okay. All right. So this year, um, majority of this year actually, I was asked to do a very simple thing at first glance: um, merge these two nuclear reactor physics codes called Bison and Proteus. Okay. Um, and sort of the state of the art, the way that they do things in the nuclear modeling and simulation world really depends on this, uh, the finite element method. And so, you know, these codes take a mesh, a mesh is some geometry with a discretization on it. Um, you know, you divide it, divide it into cubes, divide it into triangles, what have you. Um, and they sort of, they try to solve partial differential equations across, across that mesh, okay? So at first glance, yeah, just merging two codes together, whatever. Um, but this actually turns out to be a very, very difficult problem. And people said it actually couldn't be done uh, for s like six or seven years leading up to when they asked me to do it. Um, Bison and Proteus are both built on top of completely different frameworks. Um, so, you know, huge code bases that provide certain services for the code itself to leverage to do certain things like solves, you know, using Petsy or using Trilinos or something like that. Um, Bison's built on top of Moose, the Moose framework, multi-object oriented simulation environment. Proteus is built on top of this Sharp uh, framework. And I'll talk about the specifics of those in a second. But that really makes things difficult. Uh, there's, there's language difficulties, you know, one's written in Fortran, one's written in modern C++. Uh, all sorts of stuff you have to think about. And this is all part of the NEMS uh, integrated, in, or uh, ne uh, Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation Program, NEMS, right? And so, on top of all these technical difficulties, you also have programmatic difficulties. You know, different uh, frameworks are used at different institutions, and you know, how do you get to work with all these different people and get them working together to work with you to make sure that you can achieve this goal, right? Um, 
More on the programmatic aspect, Neems is actually divided into three separate product lines, and it's envisioned as a toolkit of advanced modeling and simulation technologies. It, so the, the overall vision of Neems is that, you know, uh, one person that, uh, one of my colleagues put it really perfectly, it's like you have a bag of Legos, okay? And each one of those Lego pieces is a code. And you want uh, users in industry, people who aren't that computationally adept, they don't, you know, you know, they have degrees in nuclear engineering, right? They don't do computer science type uh, research. Uh, you want them to be able to reach into that bag, pull out Legos, and build something out of those Legos that achieves whatever modeling and simulation goal they need to do to be able to certify a new reactor or something like that, okay? Um, and so that's the vision of NEMS, plug and play, right? I want to take Bison and I want to take Proteus and I want to mix them together to improve solution fidelity for looking at a, a LWR, a light water reactor fuel rod. Uh, we, that's the vision of NEMS, that's what they want, okay? And to achieve that, they've developed these product lines. And these product lines have sort of become disjoint in a sense. And that's what this project that I was working on is trying to do, is try to merge these three uh, across product lines and use different tools and provide this sort of Lego paradigm, okay? Uh, we have the re reactor product line, which basically is Sharp. Uh, Sharp is a, is a framework that uh, Proteus leverages. Proteus is this Neutronics solver. NEC 5000 is also part of that. It's a, a, a computational fluid dynamics code, Diablo structural mechanics code. So these three applications working together, built on top of Sharp, solve complex coupled simulations, right, for nuclear reactors. We have the fuels product line, which is basically uh, Bison, which is a uh, engineering scale fuel performance code. Marmot is a sort of a micro scale or meso scale fuel performance code. So it looks at sort of the internal structure of fuel rods and fuel pellets. And then we have the in integration product line. This is the group of people and codes that are trying to merge the two across these lines, right? We have Moose, which I said is multi-object uh, oriented simulation environment. It's a framework for building physics codes off, based off the finite element method. Sigma provides uh, a bunch of tools like a MOAB, uh, uh, mesh format, mesh library, um, reactor geometry genera generator and stuff like that. We have ICE, which we develop here as part of my team. The, in, uh, the integrated computational environment this, that provides a workbench to enable users to efficiently use these tools. And then we have what I'm trying to do this year in this work, okay, uh, which will try to really bridge the gap between the reactor product line and the fuels product line, okay. Just at a high level, what does Sharp even look like? Um, so Sharp, Sharp and Moose sort of uh, differenti differenti uh, differentiate each other from each other by saying, all right, Sharp is a uh, coupling framework that is designed such that the users who are building physics applications on top of it build from the bottom up. And by bottom up, I mean we have existing legacy physics codes like Proteus, which is you know, around for 10, 15 years, um, we have, and, and NEC 5000, and we sort of build code around them to uh, achieve this coupling, okay? Whereas a top-down approach would be Here's the framework, start from scratch, and leverage the framework entirely to build new physics codes, okay? Sharp is trying to leverage as much as existing uh, work as possible, um, and the great uh, results from all these legacy physics codes like Proteus and NEC. And it does so by providing a MOAB mesh backplane, okay? So each physics code at the top here basically just provides a little bit of code that trans translates their mesh, internal mesh format to the MOAB mesh format. And once it's in the MOAB mesh format, then the rest of Sharp and this Coupe library, this coupling library they call it, can do the rest, okay? Because the coupling library is designed to work with MOAB, all right? And so it can then do the transfers through some coupling mechanism to the other physics codes and that sort of thing, okay? So adding a physics code to Sharp requires that you provide a new um, MOAB physics mesh adapter, okay? It serves as an intermediate mesh representations between all the physics codes, okay? Um, so yeah, I just said this. Um, yeah, basically currently Sharp just couples these three applications, Proteus, NEC 5000, and Diablo to do uh, neutronics, fluid dynamics, structure, uh, structural mechanics, okay? Um, real quick, just 
you know, brief overview so you know what, what is Proteus trying to do. It's just, it's a neutronic solver. It uses a second order neutron transport uh, equation. Um, it actually uses its own homegrown internal mesh data structures. A lot of codes will use LibMesh or Moab or StickMesh or whatever, but they've actually developed their own that works for best for them. Um, it's massively parallel. So it runs with MPI, the message processing uh, or passing interface. Um, and it's been shown to scale up to 100,000 cores. So really, really large uh, simulations. They use Mira and Argon for that. Um, it's completely, basically Fortran. It's Fortran 90 uh, in a lot of places. The Moab uh, adapter that they wrote is actually like Fortran 77, I'm pretty sure. Actually, I take that back, it's Fortran 90 as well. There's other pieces that are Fortran 77. It has a few C preprocessor definitions. Um, um, and it basically, it just, its solve is uh, le uh, leveraging the Petsy library. I, I'm, I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with Petsy, but it provides parallel matrix and vector data structures to do these, you know, Krylov solves and stuff like that. All right, so let's move over to the fuels product line and what is Moose? So Moose, like I said, is trying to approach the problem of physics coupling from a top-down approach. They provide a lot of extensible subsystems within this framework for you to extend to uh, build your physics application from the top down, okay? Uh, you don't really usually, we, we did in this work, but uh, you don't usually inject a legacy phys physics code uh, into Moose, okay? You do it from the top down, you, do, you create new physics codes from scratch, okay? Uh, it's C++, it's modern C++. They actually just switched over to C++11, um, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, but anyway, it's got all these subsystems within the framework for doing things like uh, executing solves. So these, this executioner block is really important for the work that I'm about to discuss, okay? Uh, for uh, writing physics kernels. So uh, they have some built-in physics kernels like diffusion and conduction that you can just use from an input file. You just say, I want to use this kernel for this solve, and this is how I'm defining the weak form of my partial differential equation or whatever. Uh, you can, you know, expose new boundary conditions, new material properties, that's a big one. Um, and, you know, just so many different things, right? All of these are extensible. If you need functionality for a new subsystem, you just write it. It's, you know, it's a C++ implementation file. That's about it. Okay. At the very highest level, a Moose uh, execution. So you are defining a Moose app, what they call a Moose app uh, entry point for your physics, okay? Um, to define a Moose app, basically what you, you're, you're starting off with your coupled set of partial differentials. You're gonna express that in some weak form. That weak form is in a format that basically tells you, you know, what pieces of physics are in there, what boundary conditions, and um, they have so much infrastructure within the framework that injecting your new physics from your weak form here, here in the middle, usually is like one or two lines of code. It's actually really cool. Um, this last part here is just the implementation of like one method that you have to do um, to expose your kernels to Moose and then just have users leverage it from an input file, just a text input file. It's really, really extensible, okay? All right, so we talked about Proteus, let's talk about Bison now. Um, Bison is an engineering scale, so it's, uh, it's sort of looking at a, a larger scale of what's happening in, the, in a like, light water reactor fuel rod, okay, or fuel pellet. Um, it's an engineering scale code that attempts to solve this, these three coupled uh, sets of equations. Uh, to do so, they express these equations in their weak form, they write kernels for it, they write boundary conditions, they write new material uh, definitions. They inject it all into the Moose framework and they let Moose run the overall solve, okay? And so, you know, they asked me, go ahead, couple Bison and Proteus. You know, why, why would you even want to do that, right? Um, well, first and foremost, um, we want to be able to improve Bison's solution fidelity, right, for some of their assessment cases. Their assessment cases are, you know, what are indus industry looking at to say, oh, this code is something that I should use because it got this level of accuracy on one of the results, right? So we want to be able to improve the solution fidelity for those assessment cases. Well, what is one aspect of Bison that's lacking right now? Um, 
Well, what about its power density feedback uh, mechanism, right? So when you have a nuclear reactor running, you have the neutrons you know, being ejected from the radioactivity of the uranium and on and on and on. Um, how, do the, how do those neutrons interact with the surrounding medium, other fuel rods? Well, basically what Bison does to, to model that is just provide a piecewise function, right? Something that they've, they've maybe noticed from experiment or something like that. They provide this function into the framework and they use that to calculate the power density at certain points of their simulation. It would be a lot better if you had an actual physics code running that solve and then returning the result of some power density or what have you back to Bison for it to use in the rest of its solve. Okay? So that's why you want to couple Bison and, and Proteus. There's other like programmatic reasons within NEMS. You know, we want to see interoperability between Moose and Sharp and all sorts of stuff. Um, and just overall connecting separate efforts across institutions is always a great thing. Uh, but the real key thing for the physics is to provide a more accurate source term, a power density function from Proteus back into Bison. <laughs> okay, so um, what does the, uh, the merger of Bison and Proteus look like? Well, it's an application that we wrote called Warthog, okay? And so uh, the name is Warthog for uh, a number of reasons. But, you know, when you, when you make a Moose app, you, you basically the thing that they say is just call it an animal name, right? All of the Moose apps that were first in, uh, created, and Moose comes out of the Idaho National Lab, by the way, I didn't say that. But they're all based, they're all called different animals that are found across Idaho. And so people have just kept that sort of animal thing going with all the Moose apps. So, um, so we decided, all right, we've got to choose an animal name. So actually, I chose um, to start off with Puma. Yeah because it was like Proteus something, Neutronics app or something like that. And uh, turns out that that, actually name, that name was actually taken a while ago. And so, um, and it didn't do well, it failed. And so it, it kind of had a bad connotation to it within the program and with, within the, the field. So uh, my buddy, uh, Jay Billings said, Puma, that reminds me of the red, red versus blue YouTube video where the warthog light comes in. So we decided to call it warthog because of that. So, you know. When you do computational physics, you can name your projects pretty much anything. So. Is it short for anything? No, it's just, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's a great question, though. Um, it's a little too long for me to come up with some acronym or something like that. Anyway, so this, this application, it's a Moose app, right? Uh, it subclasses the Moose app entry point within the Moose framework, and it successfully bridges this gap between fuels and reactors. It, it is a coupling mechanism for Bison and Proteus, okay? So how does it work? So basically, um, you know, I'm one person. This is actually a really huge project. So the, the, the way to go about this is to leverage as much existing NEMS work as possible. Pull out as many of those Lego pieces out of the bag, as I, like I mentioned before, as you can, right? Uh, the first thing that we're going to uh, leverage is that uh, Moose, one of its extensible subsystems is this multi-apps and transfers mechanism, where you can actually couple together other Moose apps within this transfer, within this multi-app system, and then execute transfers between the apps to get solution from one mesh to another, okay? Um, and so what we decided to do was just create a new, uh, a new Warthog Moose app that we can then inject into a multi-apps and transfers solve. And all that is done just via an input file. That's how, uh, how well and how extensible Moose uh, works. Uh, the other thing is that we know that Proteus has a um, MOAV mesh adapter, so we can take a Proteus solve and uh, map it to a MOAB mesh instance, okay? Um, um, MOAB is a lot more common, uh, commonly used and uh, uh, better supported mesh format and mesh library than, I mean, it was just a homegrown mesh, internal mesh data structures for Proteus. So let's, let's push that data to something that we know we, uh, we can use more efficiently. Um, and then we can figure out a way to get Moab to Moose, which Moose is actually uh, uses a LibMesh instance. So LibMesh is another mesh library. Uh, so we can figure out a way to do that transfer, but it's easier to do that than go from Proteus internal data structures, okay? Okay. So we need a Moose app wrapper or adapter code for Proteus, okay? Uh, this is UML, uh, the Unified Modeling Language. Basically, uh, each box is a class, essentially. Uh, this line going from Warthog to the Moose app is a generalization or a subclass. So we just write a, a, a Moose app subclass called Warthog, 
okay? We then leverage the executioner subsystem of Moose to provide a new transient executioner. So we care about time dependent solves. So we'll make a transient, solve, uh, transient executioner. And we'll let that executioner interact with uh, a high level MOAB physics code interface, which provides uh, methods for initialization, pre-solve, solve, post-solve, post and then a finalized method, okay? So this MOAB code executioner just cares about initializing codes solving them and finalizing, essentially. And we let that high-level interface be a Moose object, okay? And by doing that, we get a lot of support from the Moose framework for factory patterns, and, and you can basically just say, all right, I want to, in a, in a text file, just say new, ex, new Moab code uh, Proteus or something like that, okay? We do a, a, impl a interface implementation for that Moab code interface for Proteus, and this is all C++ still. Uh, this Proteus object is in C++, um, part of the Moose framework and part of Warthog. And then that Proteus instance interacts with the Fortran interface for Proteus, okay? So the biggest thing left, so this all looks great, but we have not addressed the issue of getting data from Moab in Fortran and Proteus back to LibMesh and Moose in Warthog, okay? And to do that, uh, we use uh, another Oak Ridge developed application. It's called the Data Transfer Kit. Uh, it's by uh, Dr. Stuart Slattery here at the lab. He's in CSMD as well. Um, and the Data Transfer Kit uh, provides services, interfaces, implementations for transferring uh, solution field data from one mesh data structure and one discretization of a geometry to a completely different one. And you can transfer stuff from stick mesh to Moab, lib mesh to Moab, all, all vice versa, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and those transfers invoke uh, an extensible set of algorithms to do that, right? So L2 projection, consistent interpolation, all sorts of stuff. And so here's just a, a high level view of what we implemented. We implemented this lib mesh Moab transfer class, which just sort of served as a black box for, for our Proteus implementation to do this sort of transfer. So, uh, basically, at each pre-solve step, we do a transfer of temperature from Bison and Warthog to Proteus. Uh, after each uh, solve, we'd, in the post-solve step, we would do a transfer of power back from uh, Proteus to, to Bison and Warthog. Uh, real quick, you know, this is just a quick uh, high-level view of, of DTK. Like I said, it has mesh adapters for all sorts of different mesh formats. Um, part of this work was developing the MOAB and LibMesh adapters and then all these different transfer operators that are really great that you can just swap out with, a, with an input file. And then the actual coupling is really simple. It takes absolutely no code after that. You just expose uh, some text to your input file that says, this is my app, these are the transfers I want to do, and Moose does this overall workflow. Okay, like I said, we're transferring power and temperature back and forth, and we do this in an iterative fashion until we converge on a, on a solution, okay? Um, and then one more, uh, like this is the last slide for this section, um, sort of a software engineering thing. The, uh, the task of actually getting all these components to build together took me like two, two or three months. It, it is not easy. Um, you know, you got all sorts of different things going. You have different version numbers that these codes use. One of the issues I had was that Proteus only uses Petsy 3.4. Everybody else uses Petsy 6 now, it's you know. So you have to do all this stuff to get them building. Once you get them building, it's fine. But it's very difficult for me to go out to a guy in industry and say, please replicate the process that I had to take to build the, this, this suite of codes, right? That's a very difficult thing for somebody to ask somebody to do. Um, and so what we started to look at toward the end was advanced deployment through virtual containers. So I don't know if anybody's heard of things like Docker, these lightweight container type technologies. Um, I kind of think they're the, they're the way to go when it comes to deploying scientific apps in the future. Uh, but what we did was uh, uh, we actually developed a, a Docker image that we could just distribute and to run Warthog was a very simple Docker run Warthog. And that was it. They didn't have to build anything. It's all built within this container, pre-built. Um, so we actually, in part of the, the PI meeting talk that I gave for this, um, I did a little demo where I ran Warthog on Windows. Proteus, Moose, all these things will never run on Windows by themselves. And I ran it on a Windows laptop. So all through Docker, this is sort of what we envision as a way to deploy these apps to industry and things like that. 
Okay, so um, let's move on to the second part of uh, what I currently work on, uh, Eclipse Ice. So I'm an Eclipse platform developer. I do, I'm a committer on the Ice project. We have a project called EAVP, which is sort of a spinoff from Ice. It's the uh, Eclipse Advanced Visualization Project. We're actually uh, providing widgets and tools for uh, hooking with hooking with uh, in with visit and pair view and all these other visualization components. Um, and then there's another project called January, which is a data structures type project that I'm working on. Um, here's some uh, info on ICE. So you might have it, it's also been called in other contexts Vibe for batteries. Uh, a battery simulation project picked up ICE here at the lab and. Uh, provides their application, their simulation framework, uh, sort of as part of a, a larger ICE workbench workflow. Uh, and then Jade, I talked about that at the beginning. Jade, we extended uh, then NICE uh, to work for adiabatic quantum computing. And we got, you know, we're on uh, the Eclipse.org website. Uh, we have a bunch of YouTube videos if anybody's interested, some code stats, uh, the binaries. I mean, you don't build with ICE, we, you just pull it down, and it's already pre built for you, you just run it. Um, so, you know, why do we even think about, about providing a tool like ICE, right? So it all gets back to usability and accessibility of really, really important scientific computing codes, right? Um, I kind of think this picture's really funny, but um, you know, think of using a very complex code, uh, just like the bear trap over here, okay? There's some good stuff in the bear trap that you might want to get out. I don't really know what the chain is for, but the, you know, you got some beer, you got some smokes, you got some sunglasses or whatever. Some really good stuff you're trying to get out, right? But reaching into there and grabbing one of those things is not an easy thing to do without getting your hand chopped off, right? And so this is very similar to, you know, existing computational frameworks. They, they do great things, but they have very rusty edges, right? Uh, some of them are 20 years old. Some of these things are 20 or 30 years old. And, and also, if you want to extend those codes, if you want to add something to this bear trap, that's not really for the faint of heart, right? And so making it easier to use scientific computing uh, basically lets you expose more advanced features and complex different uh, uh, designs and really lets the domain scientists use your code to explore further, right? And so usability and accessibility are huge and it's something that really we haven't focused on up until the last five years or so, okay? Another instance of this is, you know, usability and modeling and simulation. If I want to send a message to one of my colleagues in Norway, for instance, right? Uh, he's on Twitter. I just get on Twitter and I send him a message or I send him a tweet or something. It's really, really simple. But that masks a huge amount of complexity, right? Um, if I want to send a message or use like my fusion code here, we have a fusion code uh, called Shalotl. I mean, look at that. I got to know all sorts of stuff. And, you know, if I'm not an expert in the field, if I don't know what preconditioners or field splitting or all this stuff are, I mean, what am I going to do, you know? And so it's, it's an interesting problem. It's an interesting uh, task to try to find a way to sort of mask the complexity just like they've masked the complexity for an app like Twitter or something like that, right? Like, can we make it as easy to use these really important scientific codes um, so that we can enable things, you know, enable a larger or a broader set of computer scientists or domain scientists to use them, okay? And so to do this, uh, what our team has sort of put forth is, okay, we need to provide higher level abstractions of what workflow is actually happening when you actually try to run one of these complex codes on Titan, for instance. And we call it the standard model of scientific computing, okay? sort of a pun from physics about the standard model but of particle physics. But um, all users at the very core of this problem have to do four things, okay? They have to be able to define their problem. That's, you know, define your input model, define your input file that is used for your execution. And a lot of times those files, those file formats, um, they're archaic, right? You know, they look like ancient Mayan almost. It's, um, they're just, you know, basically reminiscent of a dead language. Um, so we need to be able to, to work with those types of old formats and archaic, you know, input uh, problem formats to be able to enable people to use their, their simulations easier. You gotta be able to run the code, which oftentimes is 
also really difficult. You got to be able to work with your uh, queuing system. You're launching on some terrifying machine like Titan, which has you know some heterogeneous architecture with GPUs and all sorts of stuff, uh, and that can be difficult, right? Uh, you need to be able to take the output that you get and analyze it, which is often sometimes in a really raw, you know, binary form almost. Um, you want to be able to take that and you know show user-friendly visualizations of what actually happened as part of your simulation. And you need to be able to archive the output. You know, for some of our nuclear reactor work, that uh, data that you produce on Titan for those simulations oftentimes has to be stored for 40 years or the life of a reactor, right? You know, you have to be able to archive that and catalog it. Um, and the, the main point here is that if I wrote this code and I know everything about it, it's really easy for me. If I'm a super user, if I've spent however many months learning how to use the code, it's not that big of a deal. But most people are overwhelmed by that, okay? Most people who just want to get to their research quicker find that to be, these tasks to be very difficult. Oh, this always happens on this slide. I always forget about it. All right, so what we put forth is a cooler model of scientific computing, right? This is Jay um, in a pirate costume for some reason. I don't know. I got this slide from him. Um, it would be a lot better if we had a computer program handle all of that complexity, right? And that's what ICE does. ICE provides a workbench to, it, to achieve these uh, four tasks, okay? We are still working on this archiving output task. That's not something that is currently, you know, really awesome right now. But the other three tasks, we've really gotten down really well. And to do this, we've built on top of the Eclipse platform, okay? Let's see. Uh, we leverage Eclipse. Eclipse um, is sort of a plug-in based architecture. So basically you can define certain extension points to Eclipse uh, that people can implement and just drop it into the, into the platform and it runs just automatically. And so we write extension points for these four tasks, okay? Uh, defining a model, defining a problem, defining, you know, running the simulation. These are all plugins that we've written for Eclipse, okay? Um, and like I said, ICE does the first three very well. We're still working on the last one. But it's 100% open source. You can just go on GitHub, github.com slash eclipse slash ice, pull it down, fork it, do whatever you want, uh, give us pull requests, all that kind of stuff. Primarily developed here, but we've got collaborators all over the world, actually. Um, we have collaborators in Norway, uh, Britain, you know, Berkeley, all over, really. Um, it's a couple other uh, small businesses as well. Uh, the main focus, like I said, is just making life easier for the average domain scientist. I want to make it such that they can get to their research results faster, okay? How does it work? Well, we've got this sort of high-level view of our, our architecture where basically we have this core component that executes a set of what we call ICE items, okay? And an item can be a uh, model, it can be a job launcher, it can be uh, all sorts of different things that you as a developer can inject into the platform with a very minimal amount of code. Uh, you can leverage our ICE data structures component. We have all sorts of data, construct, uh, data structures to show tree views, matrices, uh, just general user input, string boxes, all sorts of stuff, okay? So for a developer, if you want to add your simulation code to ICE, it's just writing a very simple set of, uh, small set of code uh, and injecting it into the ICE platform as a plugin, okay? If you're a user, you just go to our website and download it and just start using it. We've got uh, support for all sorts of different projects. We've got support in ICE for probably like 150 different codes, um, all sorts of stuff. It's just a, a zip file, you unzip it. We have all sorts of online tutorials on our wiki. Um, all sorts of user-friendly type stuff, okay? And here's what it does in nine pictures or less. I'll go through them. We got a, a SFR reactor over here on the left, a, a domain-specific view for nuclear, react, nuclear engineers. Um, it's really easy for us to expose domain-specific views just by writing a little bit of code. Uh, up here is a reflective, in the middle is a reflectivity calculation where we use our CSV plotting tool, comma-separated value format uh, input file for that. Um, visit integration, if anybody's uh, familiar with visit, it's a, a large scale visualization toolkit coming out of, uh, I believe, Berkeley. Um, some more visit stuff with a TRISO nuclear fuel pellet, battery simulation, uh, domain specific view for nuclear uh, analysis over here, 
we have a 3D geometry editor. So you can actually construct a complex geometry in ICE to then be shipped off to be meshed or something like that for your simulation. Uh, uh, this is the three, let's see, what is this? This is the, uh, a, react, uh, a reactor plant view, actually, that we've constructed via our 3D uh, geometry editor. This is actual data from the SNS down here, the Splation Neutron Source. Uh, this is phonon scattering data down here that, this is actually something that two years ago one of our summer students put together, was this, uh, this plotting package. And very easily, you know, over the course of six weeks and then injected it into ICE. Where does it all work? Um, we work all sorts, in all sorts of different fields. Um, advanced materials over at the SNS. Like I said, we work with Moose and nuclear energy, Warthog. Uh, data analysis, the VIBE um, framework from John Turner's group here at the lab uh, for battery simulation. I've extended it for quantum computing on a number of different projects. Here I'm showing Jade. Um, and then we have 2D mesh editing and 3D geometry uh, construction. Okay. So just to get a little more uh, specific on how you would actually use uh, ICE, I'm going to show you how we use it with nuclear energy and how we've used it for Moose. And so with the stuff that we've developed for Moose, any Moose app, Warthog, Bison, any Moose app immediately becomes accessible through ICE because of the generality that we designed into our uh, uh, plugins for, for, uh, for Moose. Okay. So the first thing, we need to be able to define a problem, right? Moose takes a git, it's called a git pot file. It's like this hierarchical block structure for key value pairs in sections, but it's, it has to be verified and validated against a specification. And this specification is called YAML. I think it's called yet another markup language or something like that. Um, these, you know, normal Moose users who are, who have not, you know, moved on to use Eclipse or ICE, you have to go into a, into VI or Emacs or something and just start typing this stuff out. You don't, you don't know what you can write into the input file unless you look in the YAML. The YAML is tens of thousands of lines long, really complicated to, to use. And so it'd be nice if we had some higher level abstraction that let us you know, express these input files and input specifications and provide you know, like a tree view. Like this is a tree data structure for this Gitpot input, right? And so that's what we have, that's what we've done. Uh, ICE provides readers and writers, uh, and a reader and writer interface, and we just implemented one that basically reads in the, the input file, validates it against the YAML, and then exposes the input file as a very simple and user-friendly tree. You just move through that tree, you can add stuff to it, add physics kernels, all sorts of stuff. Uh, then running the simulator, uh, ICE provides, we provide a uh, job launcher item, a job launcher plugin, and we just leverage that. We don't really even do much extra. It, it's general enough to where it will work with the Moose framework. Um, and here's a simulation or an example of running it on 32 cores so we can we can launch stuff in parallel if we want and we even have docker support so we can launch docker containers docker images uh, to execute uh, like really complicated uh, moose moose applications okay uh, for the visualization part of the standard model um, like I said we provide um, simple 1d plotting tools 2D plotting tools, uh, and then we integrate with Visit. And right now, we're working on and have prototypical support for uh, for Paraview. Paraview is another uh, sort of Visit-like visualization toolkit from Kitware. Okay. Um, so this is yeah something similar. It's it's very easy for a developer to make sure that their uh, their meshes or their visualizations that they want to see are added to the proper uh, data structure for ICE. And this is the finished product. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, since we are Eclipse, we have uh, C++ development stuff. We have Java development stuff. And so as a Moose user, I can, I can do all my Moose app development, launching, analysis, everything from within one workbench. And this shows every single piece of that. Um, shows the uh, source code on the left, the, uh, the tree view on, in the middle there, the solution uh, being sh uh, piped through visit in the middle. And this was a, simu a test simulation I came up with. It was a convection diffusion problem to show how coffee, a coffee mug heats up or something like that. Um, and this, this thing will move in time. You can push the play button and all sorts of stuff. All right, so this is the last, uh, last part of my work, quantum computing, okay? And I gotta make the plug here. We have the, uh, 
here at Oak Ridge, the Quantum Computing Institute, uh, headed, up, headed up by Travis Humble. And it's sort of an interaction point for all um, people here at the lab who are interested in quantum computing to uh, sort of foster collaboration, uh, work on different aspects of the problem of quantum computing from you know, programming to device architectures, uh, you know, experimental stuff, theoretical stuff, all sorts of things. Um, you know, we leverage all sorts of expertise across the lab, computer science, math, modeling, simulation, all sorts of stuff. So uh, if you're interested, we have an email address, quantum at ornl.gov. So just send a, uh, an email. We have a newsletter that comes out every other day or so. So, sure. All right. So, you know, what, what is quantum computing? Why is it, you know, something that's interesting? Um, you know, basically at a high level, it's, it's saying, all right, Right now, we compute with ones and zeros. What if we computed with a one, a zero, and anything in between, okay? What if we encoded information in, instead of a bit, into a qubit? Where a qubit is a, a two-level quantum mechanical system, okay? Uh, and basically can be described by a wave function that looks like this in the middle, uh, that psi, right? Where you have a, a superposition of two basis vectors, right? Um, it can be sort of visualized with this block sphere idea where your wave function sort of exists on the sphere anywhere here. Um, but when you measure a qubit, you only get a zero or a one, right? Um, so what, what you, to leverage sort of, uh, to sort of get more computational uh, power out of a qubit, you want to start to build up a set of these qubits, right? And you want to entangle those qubits such that they're their wave vector, their state, is sort of a, a composition such that if I measure one, uh, I know immediately what the other one is, right? And so in doing that, instead of uh, storing in, what is it? Uh, let's see. Instead of storing in n bits, you're now storing in two to the n uh, amplitudes for this wave function, okay? And so to perform a quantum computing uh, calculation, you know, in, the, in sort of the gate model sense, you can start to apply one level or uh, two qubit gates, one qubit gates, like a Hadamard transform and stuff like that to, per, to sort of put things in superposition, to entangle qubits, and then sort of let your evolution happen, right? And at the end, measure what your state is. And if you've programmed your algorithm correctly, then the, the measurement, the ones and zeros that you read out actually provide you the solution to your problem. Um, there's also other ways to do it. So what we do a lot here is adiabatic quantum computing. Uh, we work a, a lot with D-Wave, where you basically, you don't have this gate model idea, this circuit idea. You take a lattice of qubits, and you look at its, its energy landscape. And you try to evolve that energy landscape in time such that you preserve an initial ground state, and at the end, you can read out the current ground state, which would encode the solution to your problem. Another one that Microsoft is looking at is uh, in a lot of topological computing. That one I don't know much too, too much about, but it essentially uh, you basically construct anions and let them their world lines braid over each other, and it sort of is uh, a long-term future idea, but provides sort of fault-tolerant quantum computation, which is really interesting. Uh, all of these other ones sort of are um, uh, have inherent noise and decoherence, and that's sort of what you're trying to prevent as you're doing one of these quantum computations, you know. Uh, any stray electro, uh, uh, EM field or um, you know, a photon coming into the system, anything can disrupt the wave function during your computation, your evolution, okay? And so you want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, you know, quantum computing was interesting to begin with in the 80s. I think Richard Feynman started talking about it to begin with. Um, you know, the idea of using quantum systems to simulate other quantum systems uh, to get over the, uh, the exponential problem for, you know, uh, the wave function, you know, the wave function scales 2 to the n, which, you know, if you're going to put it on a classical machine, means you have to keep track of 2 to the n complex numbers, which for 30 or 40 qubits, you know, as you get higher and higher, it starts to become more than the number of atoms in the universe. And so it's very difficult to simulate these things classically. So Richard Feynman says, all right, well, let's use a quantum system to simulate a quantum system. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, 1994, Peter Shor puts forth his factoring algorithm. That's sort of where everyone's like, whoa, okay, this stuff is actually pretty important. 
you know, we've got an algorithm here with the, with the proper size quantum computer that could break all security, all encryption uh, that's used over the internet today, right? The RSA encryption system. Um, and so this sort of spun out the, the whole field of developing quantum algorithms. Um, you know, the performance of these algorithms is measured in terms of, of how much speed up do you get? Uh, you know, is it, a, is it a polynomial speed up from the existing classical algorithm, super polynomial? Um, how much space does it take up? How many qubits do you need to use to, to achieve it? Um, there's some problems, though, that are, will always be classically more efficient, you know? Um, so, which means, you know, quantum computing, while it does prove and, and allow you to do a lot of really interesting things that you couldn't do before, you know, it's not a, a catch-all. It's not going to, you know, you're not going to have an OS that's built on top of a quantum computer, you know. It's certain systems, you know, for material science, modeling, all sorts of stuff, it will benefit um, and provide speed-ups, but other things it won't. All right, this is good. This is a list of quantum algorithms just to give you an idea. Um, factoring, Peter Shore gives a super polynomial speed-up. Grover's algorithm, which lets you search a database in polynomial time. Um, phase estimation is actually really big for material science. It lets you pick out uh, and uh, find eigenvalues of a, of a Hamiltonian, which are the energy uh, values of your Hamiltonian. You know, all sorts of other stuff. Partition functions for statistical physics. And this is what Shor's algorithm looks like from, a, from the circuit perspective. You basically take your, your qubits and or, uh, a number of your qubits and put them into a superposition with this what's called a Hadamard gate. Uh, do a couple other gates, uh, two qubit gates, and then perform a Fourier, quantum Fourier transform inverse. Okay, read out the results with this measurement block here at the end, and use that in the rest of your uh, Shor algorithm. There's a classical component to it as well. Um, so yeah, I talked about this already pretty much, but. And I thought this picture was kind of cool with the braiding, but yeah, so you got the circuit model, you know, what we just showed right here. You got the topological model, and you got the adiabatic quantum computing model, which is what D-Wave is putting forth. Google is also, uh, Google bought a D-Wave machine, and they're sort of kind of reverse engineering it and kind of making it better for them. And they're doing a lot of work with adiabatic quantum computing. Um, it's just a, a, a view of what actually currently exists today. So, um, you might have seen recently, IBM actually just put out a five qubit chip for use by people over the internet. So it's a, it's a qubit chip on the cloud, okay? You can actually uh, go to their website and um, you know, have a view of the circuit and just start putting uh, blocks down, putting gates down. And uh, push go and it'll either use their simulator or to use the actual five qubit chip to solve whatever program you just put in there. Um, you got uh, superconducting chips. The one from D-Wave is, you know, right now it's at 1,152 qubits. Um, and then you have QKD systems, which use quantum computing principles, quantum information principles to do uh, encryption via quantum means. Uh, random number generators, you know, you know, in classical computing, we have pseudo -nam random, random number generators. With quantum computing, you can get actual random number generators that are really random. Let's see. All right, so uh, we do a lot of work with the D-Wave system. Um, we're starting to work a little bit with IBM, but um, the D-Wave chip is interesting. Uh, there's a lot of people that say, you know, is it quantum, is it not? Um, I think people classify it more as a quantum annealer than they do a quantum computer, an adiabatic quantum computer per se. Basically, it is a lattice of qubits, okay? The, right now, the current system has, like I said, 1,152 qubits. Um, minus a few actually because there are some faults when you actually generate the chip via existing, you know, classical silicon uh, chip integrated stuff, uh, lithography and things like that. Um, but it's in this 2D chimera layout. So this graph here in the middle, that's what the actual hardware looks like, okay? And each one of those nodes is a qubit and each edge is uh, a physical connection between one qubit to another, okay? And so they, they basically build up this structure from unit cells. So that each, you can tell that there's clusters of qubits. Clusters of eight qubits form a unit cell, and then each unit cell is connected across or down the, the 2D structure, okay? Uh, each qubit itself, so they've actually uh, constructed their qubits to be superconducting qubits, okay? So they lower the temperature down with a dilution refrigerator to about 
uh, 14 millikelvin. Um, and at that temperature, when you pass current through these little niobium loops, it's uh, niobium metal, um, with this little junction here, this Josephson junction, it's probably hard to see in the back, uh, you get a current that flows both counter and counterclockwise and clockwise at the same time. It's in a superposition of, of current states, okay? Which gives you a magnetic field pointing up or a magnetic field pointing down, right? And so uh, that's, your, that's your psi, your two-level system, okay? And they just take those and they build up a whole structure of them, okay? And there's a picture of what it looks like, the chip actually looks like, uh, over there on the on your left, Let's see. So basically, what it's trying to do is it's taking the overall energy landscape for all of these qubits. It's saying, all right, uh, let me put it into a state that I know uh, that I know the ground state for, okay? And then it's going to say, let's let's encode the problem that we want to solve into a future energy landscape, and have the system evolve very slowly such that at the end, I know for a fact from theorems from quantum mechanics that I am going to be in the ground state of that problem Hamiltonian, that problem energy landscape. Once I've done that, if I've done it successfully, and that evolution itself is only 30 microseconds, usually, you can actually change that parameter, but usually it's 30 microseconds. Once I've done that, then I can actually measure all the qubits, their ones and zero states, and that should encode the ground state solution to the problem that I encoded into it. And that's all they're trying to do here. Um, sort of the issue comes in for us, for me, part of my research is how do I take a high level problem and map it to that energy landscape, okay? How do I map it down to uh, that energy landscape that I'm trying to evolve to, right? And that mapping problem is um, for general, uh, you know, input graph and hard input problem and hardware adjacency graph. That's an NP-hard problem itself. So Travis always likes to joke, you need a quantum computer to program the quantum computer, okay? So, you know, what are you going to do? You're kind of, kind of screwed right there. But uh, basically, these D-wave machines, adiabatic quantum computing machines, can solve one problem, okay? One type of problem. And it's this quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem. That function at the top, it is a function of ones and zeros, okay? Um, and you want to find the minimum, so you want to find the ones and zeros that give you the minimum value of that function, okay? That function looks very similar to the icing model from statistical physics, okay? And so what D-Wave has done is they've constructed a qubit lattice that can be described by this icing model. And then the problem comes in, how do I take the function up on the top and map it into the Hamiltonian, this icing model, this, this energy landscape, right? And that's a problem called minor graph embedding, and it's, it's NP-hard, like I said, okay? But there are methods to do it. Uh, exact methods scale, like, really badly, exponentially, to uh, K, where K is the branch width of your graph or something like that, okay? So we actually, to sort of uh, make this easier for people to leverage AQC, adiabatic quantum computing, we came up with this programming environment, this is a development environment called Jade, which just extends ICE to provide plugins specific for adiabatic quantum computing. So for expressing this Cubo function, um, doing the mapping, the, the minor graph embedding problem, uh, parameter setting for the machine itself, so you're actually giving it machine level instructions, uh, executing the machine, like telling it to, to evolve according to a certain annealing schedule, uh, an evolution schedule, and then reading out and returning the actual, mapping the result back to the function that you gave it, right? So Jade is an Eclipse-based development environment that does all this for the user in sort of a graphical and intuitive way, okay? It even does remote execution on the actual D-Wave chip, okay? Um, so I wanted to talk, touch quickly, we're wrapping it up here in a sec, but touch quickly on sort of this minor graph embedding problem. Um, like I said, there's exact methods that scale exponential, so you don't want to use those. Um, Travis Humble and uh, one of his students and another staff scientist here at the lab came up with a, uh, um, an embedding uh, algorithm that sort of leveraged the, this idea of tree width of a graph that sort of gave you um, an easier way that wasn't exponential to find some graph miners, some minor graphs uh, embeddings 
for the D-Wave chip itself for certain problems. And then the state of the art uh, actually was from a team at D-Wave that came up with um, a heuristic method for computing minor graph embeddings where you actually randomly, you take, you go, you say, I, want, I have a, a set of problem vertices and I'm gonna map each one of those problem vertices to a bag of vertices in the hardware, okay? And I'm gonna do that iteratively until I find a good embedding, okay? Um, and to do that, they use uh, just basic shortest path algorithm, the Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. Um, and they, they invoke that algorithm many, many times to find uh, these shortest paths that would give you a good embedding between the various bags on the hardware graph, okay? So what we started to do this year is to provide sort of a improvement on top of that algorithm. Um, we developed a library, a C++ library um, called Quell. Quell to suppress with the extra E, Quell embedding. Um, it actually provides an AQC programming and translation compilation type uh, library for parallel computing platforms. So whereas the existing D-Wave heuristic algorithm is gonna go, you know, I gotta execute Dijkstra's algorithm all sorts of, you know, a whole bunch of times. What if we could actually distribute that work over a larger computing system? And that's what Quell tries to do. We've implemented a CMR, uh, this uh, Kai, Mc, uh, McReady, and Roy algorithm, uh, CMR algorithm that's distributed across a large number of cores uh, to sort of provide speed ups. And I've got a little result here. Um, the actual CMR uh, algorithm is this top red plot here where we're actually trying to embed graphs of size 10, 10 nodes all the way up to 49 nodes where every single node is connected. So that's the hardest, basically the hardest uh, instance that you can actually solve uh, for this specific algorithm. And just by using, you can't really see it, but uh, two cores, four cores, eight cores, 10 and 12, we show uh, uh, runtime scaling improvement. So that's my current uh, sort of quantum computing work. And just to sum up, uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me here today. Um, you know, I, I, I really enjoy uh, the opportunity to work here at the lab. You know, you get to work on a bunch of really cool stuff as sort of this computational physics and scientific software engineer uh, role. And Oak Ridge has been a really great place for me to work, and I hope you guys are finding the same thing as you've, as you've come here for your summer internships. There's so many different people to collaborate with. Everybody's doing all sorts of great stuff. It's just a really great place to work, and I've just shown you three of my really fun projects. So thank you very much. So yeah, if there's any questions, you know, go ahead and ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I checked it out on the computer yeah. real quick. And uh, from my impressions, it seemed like it was actually quantum computing, but you commented that there's some type of debate yeah. between whether it is or not. So, yeah. so adiabatic, yeah, uh, adiabatic, well, okay, there's a huge debate whether or not they are employing quantum processes to achieve this computation, right? And they've actually put out a paper in the last year, I believe, that showed um, that there is actual quantum tunneling occurring. So basically when you have this energy landscape, you have a local <coughs> minimum, right? And you want to get to the global maxima, maximum, or the global minimum, sorry. Um, normally you have to go through some sort of thermal activation to get over these energy humps, right? Uh, well, what they've shown is actually that it's probably actually employing quantum tunneling, whereby the actual state of the system will tunnel through these, bar these energy barriers. And so that's sort of like the, the controversy of whether or not it's using quantum stuff. The thing about adiabatic quantum computing versus uh, quantum annealing sort of comes to uh, uh, a point of, are you doing this? So when they first put out AQC as a, a, a model of computation, I don't believe that they uh, considered uh, temperature as part, of their, as part of their theory. And so basically in a temperature bath, so you're still at 15 millikelvin, you're having a little bit of noise that's actually uh, contributing to the state uh, not actually finding the right minimum. And so, um, and then they've, they've compared it to actual classical quantum uh, Monte Carlo and shown that, you know, it is very similar to the quantum tunneling effect and all that kind of stuff. So, hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, it probably generated more questions. <laughs> well, you can come, we can talk after this if you'd like, so. All right. Yeah, yes. Yeah, 
The main bottlenecks, okay. So I think in the next five to 10 years, you'll see you know, 30 to 50 qubit chips. I mean, IBM has just put out, I mean, they have, I think they have 10 or 12 qubit chip in-house, but they've exposed just the five qubit one. Main bottleneck for, for me personally, I think is going to be, um, I have no doubt that material scientists and these people at these world-renowned labs are gonna be able to uh, overcome these technical difficulties of decoherence and things like that. I think one of the main difficulties and what I'm trying to address right now is, I know they're gonna do it, how do we make it accessible and usable by a broad community of scientists such that we get things like better quantum algorithm research, leveraging these uh, quantum chips as accelerators in existing HPC applications. So just like a GPU, right? Let's have a QPU, for instance. Um, things like that. I, I'm, I'm more focused on the, the programmability aspect and can we bring this to a broader range of scientists? So, yeah. No, no, more than likely uh, in the foreseeable future, I think at least, and a number of people that I've talked to would say the same thing, quantum computing will be a, a cloud-based technology, right? You have to have a dilution refrigerator for the majority of these, these technologies, which gets you down to these millikelvin temperatures, right? And so I don't think you're gonna have that in your, in your home, right? Or your home office or your, your workstation <coughs> over here, but um, so yeah, I think it'll be a cloud-based technology that we can sort of invoke via some web API or something like that in a larger compu classical computation. Okay. Right back in the back. So actually, that's a good question. I don't exactly know the exact size of the chip, but it's, it's not something that's huge scale or anything like that. I mean, it's a, it's a chip, right? And uh, the actual box that it sits in is like 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters, right? And there's this, uh, this sort of, I would call it like a chandelier looking thing that drops down from the ceiling. And the lower you go on that, that apparatus, the colder temperatures you find in the system and the chip sits at the very bottom. And so, like it sits in a 10 foot, or 10 meter by 10 meter cube or whatever. Um, so that might give you a sense of the scale. I don't know the exact size of it, so. Yeah. I have a question about your computer engineering codes. Is it a hard sell to get industry to adapt new codes? So I actually, um, I would say yes. I don't per se interact with people in industry directly, sort of my management does. And they say, you know, we have this technology developed by so-and-so, you know, I think it would benefit you. I think that one major drawback is this, app, this idea of building the software stack that, they, that is required to execute these really large complex simulations. And I think that one way to improve the way the, the way that we get adoption in industry is to provide some sort of container type technology like I showed you with Docker. So I don't per se like interact with them, you know, directly, so I can't really answer that, but yeah. You mentioned a gentleman in 94 that uh, released a paper, Peter something or other. Peter Short, yeah. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. You said you did density functional theory for your math work? Yep. Is there any move to make some of those codes more accessible as well? Uh, well, we had a, a LDRD last year where we were going to provide some ICE extensions for uh, DFT code, but it didn't get funded. Uh, it's something that I'm interested in, and um, actually we have a current LDRD in that's uh, not, you know, we're still putting it through or whatever that would address some of those issues. But, I mean, it's something that I'm interested in. We don't have it currently, though. I actually did some work when I was in graduate school to provide, like, I don't know if you've used JMOL. Like, if you're, you know, a lot of people who are using DFT will use a molecular uh, 3D editor or whatever. And JMOL um, sort of is a standalone tool. I integrated it in, into ICE, um, but we couldn't distribute it because of the licenses. They were sort of incompatible licenses. So, but yeah, it's something that I'm interested in and we'll be looking at probably in the near future at least. All right, if there's no more questions. If anybody would like to talk to me after this, I'll be up here. 
And uh, thank you to Julie and Cheryl for having me. So thank you.